And I want you to know that uh, when he's not with you, he's on the phone trying to get something from me. Uh, so, uh, all, for all of you. Uh, so, uh, uh, well then, that, that's next, Kay. Uh, if, when he doesn't call me, then the next person who's on the phone with me, but she's got a more narrow universe of what she wants, is Kay Ness. And she's just a fantastic person who is constantly advocating for all of our seniors. So. And of course, we're here in the in the center where her husband uh, is named after. So it's an honor to be here in that respect as well. Thank you for taking time. Thank you for staying. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about something that I will be returning to Washington later today, and we will be having a debate and votes on this week. And it's the type of debate that really will affect your lives and those of seniors across our state and across our country. And that is the Republican plan that has already passed the House of Representatives that takes Medicare as we know it and ends it. And it does so in a way that not only ends it, but puts private insurance companies in the decision-making of your health care. And does so uh, at the same time while cutting benefits. And I think about the debate we had a week ago when I was trying to get the big oil companies in this country, the top five oil companies, who this year are going to make $125 billion in profits. And I said to them, you no longer need the tax breaks that exist under our tax code that gives out of all of our money as Americans and taxpayers over 21 billion dollars to the big five oil companies and I said instead of having you take 21 billion dollars let's use that money to ultimately help us reduce our deficit as a country uh, and it seems to me that if you're going to make 125 billion dollars in profits this year the last thing you need is another two billion dollars a year for the next 10 years so you can live with making $123 billion mm -hmm. instead of $125 billion in profits. And I talk about that because at the same time that our Republican colleagues oppose ending their tax breaks, they are promoting ending Medicare as we know it. And what would be the result of that? For the average New Jerseyan who is on Medicare, it would cost them an additional $6,800 out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I don't know how many of you may have this issue, but certainly uh, I know many seniors in our state who have the challenge of a great number of prescription drugs they must take. And you know, one of the things that we found out is for people who have a high number of prescription drugs, they fall into a gap in the coverage under Medicare in which they are no longer covered. We call that the donut hole. But what we did when we passed the health care law is begin to eliminate that hole starting this year. People got, if you fell into that hole, you got a $250 check from the federal government and then you started getting 50% deductions on future prescriptions. And by the time the law is fully affected two more years from now, that hole goes away. Under the Republican plan, the whole comes back. And that prescription gap in coverage ends up being once again the reality for seniors with high prescription drug coverage. And then the final thing is to think that when we grow older, and I'm certainly feeling the effects of it, so as we grow older, you know, we have challenges. You know, something goes wrong. No matter how healthy we try to keep ourselves, no matter how well we eat, no matter how we watch our diet, something goes wrong. And if you're going to try to get insurance in the private marketplace when you already have some illness, when you've had a heart condition, when you have diabetes, when you have anything that is afflicting you that is a continuing challenge, well, it's going to be very hard to get insurance in the private marketplace which is why we created Medicare in the first place back in 1964. So our Republican colleagues opposed the creation of Medicare when we created it, and now they seek to go back to privatize it. 
And I just think that's fundamentally wrong, especially when you take all of the money that they say is going to be saved and you put it to tax cuts for the wealthiest people in the country. Now, my mother uh, passed away a year and a half ago. She struggled with Alzheimer's. She worked in the factories of New Jersey as a seamstress. She worked incredibly hard uh, to help our family achieve their hopes and dreams and aspirations. And I know that she would not have lived with the dignity that she deserved in the twilight of her life, but for Medicare as her health care security and what my sister and I was able to contribute in addition to that. And I saw her struggle. And I don't want anybody's parents, I don't want any of our parents and grandparents to face that struggle and the twilight of their life. And so this budget, which has already passed the House of Representatives, and if it were to pass the Senate, would be sent to the President for his signature into law that would change Medicare, is up for a debate in the vote in the Senate this week. And I just want you to know that uh, I understand what health care security is all about. I understand that seniors are on fixed incomes. I understand that when we talk about a value of honoring our parents and grandparents who help build families and communities and struggle, that honoring them from a federal perspective is making sure that they have health care security in the twilight of their life. And I am going back to the United States Senate to argue against, to vote against, and to urge my colleagues to defeat this proposal because we cannot privatize Medicare, raise costs, and cut benefits. So uh, I hope that you'll reach out to your other members of Congress and give them a piece of your mind. Adley Stevenson said it best, when I get the heat at home, I see the light in Washington. So creating a little heat here at home and letting people know that you think this is a bad idea uh, is would be a good thing. Uh, because we need to raise our voices and make sure that as we deal with our deficit problems, and we will deal with those deficit problems, but there are better ways. There are better ways, you know, as I said, we don't need to give the oil companies $20 billion in tax breaks, we can put that to deficit reduction. We don't, even the Secretary of Defense, who is a holdover from the Bush administration, a Republican appointee, continued under President Obama, has outlined billions of dollars in savings and defense and still keep the country strong. There are a whole host of programs that don't work so well, and we'll have to consider shutting some of those down. But what we cannot do is keep our promise, our commitment of this intergenerational approach. Uh, and that is what uh, this debate is all about this week. So thank you so much for having me with you today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I assure you, we're going to fight and we're going to succeed at keeping Medicare alive. one more time and not that I want to come back to the microphone but the director here told me that some of you have concerns uh, about the US Israel relationship and uh, I'll just tell you what I've always said uh, for 19 years whether in the House of Representatives or now in the United States Senate sitting in the House in the International Relations Committee and now as a senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee I've had one view that it is in the national interests and the national security interests of the United States to have a strong, unwavering relationship with the state of Israel, the one democracy in a sea of autocracy, a major trading partner of the United States, and a major ally and security ally of the United States. And for this senator, I will ensure that nothing happens in the United States Senate 
that undermines that relationship, that continues to help Israel be able to sustain itself, to secure itself, and that only a country can make for its own decision what is in its national interest and its national security. Nobody can impose it upon them, and only Israel can decide. And that's why, very recently, I authored a letter signed by 23 of my colleagues in the Senate that sent a message to the administration, we cannot send any United States taxpayer money to a Palestinian authority that has Hamas as part of that uh, government. It is an entity that does not recognize Israel's right to exist. It is an entity that calls for the end of Israel's existence. It does not ultimately honor the international agreements we've had. And so I've had a very strong view as it relates to that. And we have a very strong view as it relates to making sure that Iran does not ultimately achieve nuclear weaponry. This is a major ally of the United States. And so, so long as I am a United States Senator, I will do everything I can to make sure that that alliance right, remains strong and unshakable. Thank you very much.